from conception to design and function to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Our number one priority in existence is to meet with you, to know you, to talk with you, to walk with you, to love you and be loved by you, fellowship with you. Our temporary function is to exist in this short space of time on earth. Desires of this earth vessel that we live in now, and all of its corruption and all of its brokenness, sometimes cloud our purpose, our priority, which is you, which is your presence. Lord, we can step aside from it. We can step aside. We can peel it off like a dirty garment in the spirit. And although the flesh is weak and the spirit is willing, we have a choice, and the spirit can conquer the flesh. Our old man can be forced to die by virtue of the blood we have that power and authority to put pause on our physical existence, to clearly see the distinction and the line drawn between eternity and time and make a conscious choice to leave time <laughs> and step into eternity. <laughs> Step beyond it. I step into the grave. 
Yeah.
sack of flour. It's like a big sack of flour. It's coming off right now. It's coming off. Let the Lord take the weight off of you. Even if you don't seem like the weight is removed in the natural realm, the spiritual weight he can carry for you, no matter what the difficulty, no matter what the trial, no matter what the test is you're going through, he is strong enough to carry your weight. He is strong enough to carry your burden. Cast your cares on Jesus because he cares for you. He cares for you. Come to me, all you heavily laden or weighed down with the weights of this world. You're tired. You might be thirsty. Whatever it is, the presence of the Lord is heaven's cornucopia. The presence of the Lord is the buffet of eternity. The presence of the Lord is the living well. It's water flowing. Fill up, fill up, fill up with the Lord's gift of glory. His gift of strength. Yes, Lord.
disorientation. So just turn your eyes on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strange. Eternal shot. 
down. The water's always hurting. It's never too cold, it's never too hot, it's perfect. It just washes and washes. You don't have to worry about conserving it. You don't have to worry about just using a little bit because you don't want to be wasteful.
and the meanings of children. When we were kids, uh, well, I say when I was a kid, I was uh, 17 years old, I was singing in the church. There was the song, We Are a Chosen Generation. We would sing, We Are a Chosen Generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Well, that meant, in the King James in 1611, that word meant a specific people consecrated for God. But we took it as really weird people. Or a peculiar people. And I was happy back then at the age of 17 with being kind of a crazy person. I didn't mind. I didn't mind. And so it became part of my legacy. Last we were together in a, on the Sunday service, we talked about the legacy. And then we went on to Cambodia, had a great time interacting with the people there in Phnom Penh, seeing all the ministries and the, the students of the program were able to see various ministries and hear from them how the Lord brought them where they are. And uh, it was a good time, a wonderful time. Most powerful moment of, during the week, really for me, was in a, in a private counseling environment. And it is one of the strongest manifestations of the Holy Spirit I've ever felt. And so also the person said, and this is a, a person very familiar with the power of God, they said that they never felt anything like it. We were talking, and I was totally at an impasse. I had nothing to offer in this particular counseling situation. Have you ever counseled someone and you have nothing to say? You feel like an idiot. <laughs> First of all, maybe the depth of their sorrow and difficulty so far beyond anything you've experienced that you can't possibly know what it's like or feel what they feel, and if you even dare to say it, you sound like a fool trying to placate them with some bogus idea of fake compassion. So you're at an impact, and I was at that point. I said, I, I don't have anything to say. I said, in all my years of experience and the wisdom that I do have, both from the Lord and in my own imagination, I, I'm not going to waste your time. I really don't have anything to say to help you. Very serious situation. And then I said, but I know someone who does, and he's my best friend, and he's here with us now. As soon as I said it, we, we both just, the Holy Spirit pulled a chair up at that table when he sat down. The person I was talking to lost all feeling in their body. They were paralyzed from the chest down. No feelings could not move anything. They were frozen by God. And God came, the Spirit came, and put his hands on that person. I just sat there shaking, tears pouring down my face. Their tears pouring down their face. We were in the middle of a restaurant, and the waitress was taking the plates away, looking at us like, something's going on here. But it was a great time for me. Every trip I make, there's a, a moment where God does the greatest thing, and it has nothing to do with anything I planned. Every time. That's life. The greatest things that will ever happen through you and for you, you do not plan. You just yield to the Holy Spirit. Walk with the Spirit every day, step by step, and God will strategize everything and put it together. There's no way Joseph planned his life to be as it was. None of these things were planned. We left off talking about that, that Zacchaeus couldn't have planned to climb the tree that morning. And, and you know, I don't think that the, the woman with the issue of blood planned that on an agenda, on a calendar written, she just at the last minute said, this is what I'm going to do. She come up with it on the spot, same with the friends of the paralytic, all of those things. And so to live by the Spirit, we need to be spontaneous, walk with the Lord. So we're going to come back to the story now in Luke chapter 19, event number 231. I'm getting kind of sad because we're getting high in the numbers, and soon we will reach our 393 event mark. And... Uh, I, you say soon, so that seems like a lot of numbers away, but I'm having so much fun in this class, I wish it could just go on and on. Which it will, because we're going into the book of Acts after this. Yeah. Number 231, Jesus is near Jerusalem, Luke 19, verse 11. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem. And the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. They knew that this is it. Here's the kingdom. Ta-da! They pull out the trumpets because the kingdom is here. And Jesus is on his way right now to take over with awesome power. See, now he's going to take that power that was flowing out of him to heal the blind, the deaf, the lame, to cleanse lepers, and to multiply loaves and fish, raise dead people and open deaf ears. And he's going to redirect it to the destruction of the Romans. And rays of light are going to come out of this 
big Jesus eyes and he's gonna be like Godzilla just walking into Jerusalem. He's gonna, in fact, he's gonna grow about 50 foot tall. All of a sudden, his physical appearance is gonna be massive and he's gonna step on Roman chariots and he's, oh, and fire is gonna come out of his mouth. And so they're ready for this. They are ready for the conquest. And this is all of us. And so we always think, we always think the next, this is it, this is the thing. And you know what? It's not for us to know the times or the seasons. We just obey the Lord. We walk in the Spirit, do what God calls us to do. And then later you will have great events, things that you've accomplished, and realize, wow, that's fantastic. And everybody will give you the credit for it. And, and you'll try to say, it wasn't my idea. And they'll laugh and think, no, but you're the one. No, I'm nothing. No, but no, really, I'm nothing. I planned nothing. I did nothing. God did it all. Yeah, but you had to be, they always try to give you the credit, no matter how much you try to push. Don't take that credit, by the way. Make sure. Don't finally settle in to say, okay, yeah, I guess. No, 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 don't do that. Because that's when the Lord says, oh, really, you think that? Okay, well then, go ahead. I'll wait over here. And when everything falls apart, you call me. I'm going to be sitting over here having a cup of coffee. Go ahead. And the Lord will let you do things on your own strength until you are desperate again. I better stay desperate. Constantly give the glory to the Lord at all times. Now, as Jesus is there near Jerusalem, number 232, he shares the parable of the meanest. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, sir, the amina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. The second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. And another servant came and said, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Well then, why didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, he said, he already has ten. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. It's interesting that as they're approaching Jerusalem too, Jesus is sharing stories like this, of course, as analogies and parables. But, and, and he is going to have a kingdom. So they are kind of thinking also this is talking about the now. And Jesus didn't make it perfectly clear. If they have been listening to the whole process of what was about to take place, they would have accepted it. But remember, it said that they were not understanding what Jesus was saying when he said he was going to die. He handed over to the, to the men and they were going to crucify him and beat him and, and spit on him and mock him. And they just couldn't comprehend it. It didn't go into their heads. So this parable now, they would rather hear these kind of stories and consider that that's what they are going to do. And so they continue, number 233, Therefore Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert, to a village called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. And this is the continuation after the 50, verse 53. Remember, there had been trouble as he was coming to the end of the, the Pharisees were trying to destroy him trying to kill him, and they were making pacts and agreements about how to assassinate Jesus or how to take him by force, and he had to be careful, strategizing the exact villages that he went through and the places that he moved in. Number 234, Jesus is discussed by the Jews and priests. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. 
they kept looking for Jesus. And as they stood in the temple area, they asked one another, what do you think? Isn't he coming to the feast and all, at all? But the chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that if anyone found out where Jesus was, he should report it so that they might arrest him. Now, they are in wait now in Jerusalem, of course, making these plans and wondering if he's ever going to come because he's not. He's biding his time by teaching and sharing all these stories we're hearing. He's doing this in the periphery of the city. This is the last thrust. He's finally going to come in and, and go through this, but we find ourselves in the middle of the Gospels, but he's just kind of making circles around to the little areas near the main city because he knows that they're waiting there for him, but he's got to live his life on the schedule of the Father, exactly what the Father says. He knows that his main objective is go into Jerusalem, be handed over. He's spoken his vision out several times handed over to the men, be beaten, be ridiculed, be crucified, buried, and after dying, be buried and rise again from the dead. That's his big vision, his plan. That's his ministry, the greatest thing that he will ever do. But it's not time. And sometimes the Lord will reveal to you a great thing that you're supposed to do, and it may take a long time for you to get there. But don't be in a hurry. Just do what the Father says. And that's why you see Jesus strategically going from place to place because everything that he did, he did according to the direction of the Spirit. He was never puzzled. He was never confused about his next step. Nowhere in the Scripture do you see where it says Jesus was confused. Nowhere do you see in the Scripture where it says that Jesus was worried. Only one place we see some type of emotion that we might want to consider as some sort of weakness, but it's not, and it says Jesus wept. It was compassion. Because he's very compassionate, but he was never confused, he was never worried, never concerned about anything other than feeding hungry people, taking care of the needs of other people. And, and he was not worried about paying the taxes, but he was concerned about making sure the taxes were paid. You understand, everything he did, he did by the will of the Father, but he never worried about any of it, and yet everything was taken care of. Every move he made, he was yielding to the Spirit. That's my goal. I want to be like my big brother Jesus. Because the Bible calls him, as much as he is our Lord and our God and our Savior, he's our elder brother as an example. And I want to be like Jesus. I want to do everything that Jesus says. I'm getting better and better at it, but I'm still doing a lot of stupid things that Stephen likes to do and making some choices that God didn't choose. I see it afterward, and then I stop those things. But I want to do what the Lord says to do. And you think, well, you know what you're doing, the Lord's will, exactly right, because everything worked out, works out okay. That's, that's totally wrong thing, because it's not even scriptural. He said, we're going to go to that village. They didn't receive him. So what did he do? He went to another village. That happens. You make a plan and a strategy, and it just doesn't work out. Not even Jesus could fulfill everything the Father told him to do by command because he made the attempts to do it, but circumstances changed because of the free will of men. And so he just waited, and the father said, okay, go to another village. And so he said to the disciples, we'll go to another village. But he had previously told them, we will go to that village. Go and prepare. And they went and prepared, but the people would not receive him. And so what do you do? And this is the same for us. Well, if it's God's will, it'll work out. No, there's no we cannot conclude that all of God's plans are successful. That many of God's plans will turn out to be unsuccessful. I see it happen all the time. Recently, I saw a miraculous provision for someone, a missionary in training who had planned on going to another country, and I did everything in my power, and, and other people, and many people came together. People came to meet and to help and support and to finance this missionary's career, but that missionary didn't show up for the meeting to meet the people that I took from other countries to meet them. And so, what happened? Those people thought, well, we're going to meet this. We came here to meet this person. Well, they didn't show up. What can I do? So I was heartbroken over the whole thing. Well, I met that missionary again and, and ready to go. How's, it, how's everything coming together in there? Is it out? No, it's not. What do you mean? I brought them. I brought everything. I brought the money people. I brought the, the spiritual authority to meet you and had everything within their power for you to fly out of this country today 
everything, credit cards in hands, ready to finance it. God provided everything. But you didn't show up. And my counsel was, you can repent. Pray to the Lord. Maybe there's grace, but I'm done. I've did everything. What can I do? So therefore, you see, there was God's plan. But we, even as the servants and the missionaries and the leaders and the pastors and preachers, we can not cooperate with what God has done. <clears throat> and there are many reasons why we don't do that. But we see our elder brother, he's just going along step by step, doing exactly what the Lord called him to do. Very sad. And in fact, at the same time that I had to say that to this other missionary, I had to go then and answer an email that was sent to me from another one who was supposed to come and be here and everything worked out and visions and dreams and supernatural things arranging for that person to come and live here and come to the program this summer. But they blew it. And now they wrote me back. I'm ready to come. And I wrote them back and I said, no, don't come. What do you mean? The Lord told me. The Lord told you back whenever, whatever. So if you want to come, guess what? You come in June. You're not coming right now. You come right now and you're a burden to me. You come during the program. My life is being poured out for those three months. There it is. That's what you get. You don't come to that time. Now, I'm not going to make special provision for you privately, personally. To, that's very selfish and self-centered of you to even ask that. And so therefore, there was provision for you. The door was open. All the arrangements were made. You knew it. I knew it. And so you blew it. So I want to go anyway. Well, then go ahead. Go do, do what you have to do. Cross, cross into the promised land if you want. But you know what? There's an enemy there, and God will make no defense of you as you go in. Because now it's time to wander through the wilderness for a while. And there's a will, and then there's a deviation from the will and the purpose of the Lord. Or there's a dragging of the feet, and... Jesus, our elder brother, as he's approaching something so serious and so difficult, a lot of people don't do the things God's called them to do for that reason because they're afraid. They're afraid and they don't know, I've never been this way before. Well, there's no place you've been before if you're doing the will of the Lord because God's will is completely what you've never, ever done. So you will always be afraid. I've been waiting to not be afraid of the next step for 30 years and it never comes. I'm always afraid of the next step. <laughs> because I've never done it before. I like doing the stuff I've already done. Send me to Cambodia. Excellent. I got everything set up. I got an infrastructure. I got, I'm, my, my skids are greased. I slide right through Cambodia. No problem. I'm at home. You want me to go to Indonesia? No problem. 15 cities, relationships, houses, people. Whee! <laughs> you want me to go to Mongolia? Mm. <laughs> Looking into it right now. Check the tickets. I got the, uh, the, the, the I got the open door on that side, but I've never been to Mongolia before. So I'm thinking, hmm, how am I going to do that? How many of you want to go? Everybody feel a call from Mongolia? Anybody here feel called to Mongolia? Mongolia. Mongolia. Anybody? Okay, no way. I'll go without you. <laughs> well, it came about because Ricky is interested in Mongolia. And so, um, we could just, I just got the green light. Just got on that side. Come anytime you want. Everything is ready. A little something to be mindful. Winter comes quick. And it's cold. It's really cold. It's cold. So, but I've never done Mongolia. So I'm a little fearful. But that's fun. It's Mongolia. Yeah. <laughs> but after a couple of trips into Mongolia, you know I'm going to be sitting up here saying, Mongolia is where God wants us to be. We need to go to Mongolia. The Mongolian people are waiting for you. So it's always the next step that is fearful. And Jesus had to simply do what he had to do, and the disciples didn't understand much. And we won't always understand. We just need to obey what the Lord says. So he was discussed. Number 235, Jesus in Bethany. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. You yeah, understand that the Passover is the event. This is the time that's coming. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. The Lamb has to be offered up at the Passover. And so he's got six days in counting now. And it's interesting. John chapter 12. We're in the middle of the Gospels. And the last week of the three and a half years takes up half the Gospel. 
And that's where he, he's putting the, we used to say, is get pedal to the metal. That's when you really push the accelerator already and put the pedal to the metal. He's really putting it in high gear. Now you're going to see he's going to go out. It's like, it's like a comet burning out. And the last, the last part, he's going to go down with a tremendous force. And of course, that's in the spiritual realm, not in the natural realm like the disciples are expecting and hoping to see. Number 236. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. As soon as he come in there that week before the Passover, again, the dinner was prepared. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Yeah, I wonder what that was like, walking in the house, seeing Lazarus, you know, come in, Jesus walk in there. Because you know, they're pretty close, having been dead and all and raised. You would think you have a greater, if you had been dead and raised by Jesus, you'd have a tight relationship with Jesus. <laughs> How do you greet the guy that raised you from the dead? He's been off working, you know, and there he comes, knock on the door, and you open it. Jesus, what's up, dead raiser? Ah, slap the little hands in the air, and a hug. I always picture the personal colloquial interactions between people. Did Jesus tell any jokes? You didn't die again, did you? Because <laughs> I can raise you up. <laughs> like, what kind of. Because Jesus was a real guy, you know. They, not everything he said is written. So he had to. He's not this solemn, holy, floating man. That, no, he was a real fun person that I would have loved to heard the, the jokes and the things around him. Jesus didn't joke. That's sacrilegious to even suggest it. No, of course he, he had a sense of humor. And I wonder what kind of humor he had. What did, he, did he say little jokes like that? I'm sure he said jokes, but what kind? Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Vials of this perfume sold and the money given to the poor. It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in the bag. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. And this is a beautiful story. There's a lot in here. I, I have made a lot of decisions in my life about that last line. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Because we do not do everything in our ministries because of the poor and because of their needs. Because especially if you go to a nation like India, you will destroy yourself with the mentality of, always the poor and the poor alone. Because you can only spend so much of yourself. Some of it has to be spent on Jesus. Some of it has to be spent on what is right. Some of it has to be to take care of your own family. Some of it has to be to have a living place and to eat. And, and there are some missionaries that will become over-focused on poor. Now, and I use this scripture to balance it out. There was nothing wrong with her using that perfume to anoint the feet of Jesus. And, and here, of course, Judas was saying it should have been used for the poor. But there's other things that we do to honor the Lord. It's nice to have an atmosphere. It's nice to have a facility where we can worship the Lord. I don't have a problem with people having a building in which they can worship a nice facility. I don't have a problem with that. I would love to see a, a very nice facility provided for us all here at Church Live. I would love to see, you know, would it be nice to see Pastor Paul in a really cool office? One day, you know, in a, in a nice office, and, and he can it'd be his office, Paul's office, Paul working on the door. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had to get in the lift to go up there. And, and the lift is like a, it has like an iPad screen on it, it's got names on it. You can touch the name to see and talk to the person in the office. And uh, I'm going to relating a dream that I heard a piece of it. It said, Stephen is in his office. Uh, this was somebody actually had a dream come to see us and we were in a building like that and then in the lift there was like you could see if we were in our office in the lift and the screen in the lift isn't that cool I wouldn't mind having a building like that and so but if the Lord provides it the Lord provides it otherwise I'm just going to keep on 
doing what the Lord, as I say, I'm, I'm going to do exactly what the Lord says, his will, his purpose, and his purpose at this moment was to honor Jesus with this perfume, this nard being poured out on him, anointed for burial in preparation, and as they honored the Lord. Number 237, Mary's deed is recounted. Now, after she's done this, it's spoken about both in Matthew and Mark. While Jesus was in Bethany in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured out on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. Perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. It says in Mark 14, while he was in Bethany, Reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. Leave her alone, she said. Or Jesus said. Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me, it says in Mark. The poor will, you will always have with you, and you can help them at any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. When she poured this perfume in my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. I'll tell you the truth, wherever this gospel is preached, now in Matthew, throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. It really was important, so important that Jesus mentions again its importance and says that I want these to be in the Gospels. Nowhere else do you see Jesus say, I want to make sure in, when you prepare books one day and have a scroll, the writings, the chronicles of Jesus, whatever you're going to call it, I want you to make sure this is in that story so that it can always be remembered. Of all the things in the scriptures that seem very important, why did he single out this one thing and say, make sure this is written down? Wherever this story is told, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, this pouring of perfume on me, I want, I want people to hear about it. It means that there's a lot here, certainly more than meets the eye at a, a casual observance. That's why I always go back to the scripture. It has is, it is spoken to me in many different ways through the years about my ministry, about the way I act, about what I do. Sometimes when, when I, I feel the feelings about the contrast of what am I doing uh, to support this person or to help someone, or sometimes I can get under, I have a guilty feeling about what I should do with my finances, or guilty feeling about maybe buying something that I even need and won't. I'm notorious for, for not keeping good care of my teeth because I hate to spend the money on the dentist because I know that there's so much money that I can use to support missions works and other things. But that's kind of stupid. I mean, I'm in, I'm in the fall. I should take care of my teeth. But I just, I see the prices and I, think, I know it's cheaper in other countries, but even then, then it's time. But I have to take time to go to the dentist. And that time, really, I can be preaching and teaching when I'm in that other country. You understand how the logic goes. So the Lord often has to use the scripture to show me, you know, there's other things that have to be done too. It's okay for you to fix your teeth. Which I still haven't done. <laughs> but that deed was important. So you can take from it what the Lord speaks to you. Very important issues. Number 238, crowds come to see Jesus and Lazarus. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there at the house and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, because that had become quite a popular story. And as people were leaving out of that region and heading 
in traveling about, they carried that story with them. Remember that a lot of Jews believed it. It says that, that they heard the story, they believed it, many believed on him because of Lazarus rising from the dead. And as a result of that, now all of the people know, so they're coming together for this, this holiday season that's coming to Passover. That whole week was spent kind of in travel and fun. The kids loved it because they weren't in their regular duties and regular chores. They were on the road traveling to make sacrifice in town. You understand? It was fun. It was like a vacation time. There were the main, there was the Passover, the Festival of Booths, the Harvest Festival, there was New Moon Festival. They had a lot of holidays. If you calculate all the holidays, seriously, if you calculate all the holidays of the Jews, they spent almost a third of their year on holiday. And that's what God wanted. You understand? God wanted the people to be on holiday about 30% of the time. How many of you are violating that wish? <laughs> of course we are. But we also do not let our fields rest on the seventh year. We also can go through a lot of things that if we did them, really, we, we would have more fruitful fields. We'd have better crops, healthier. The enzymes could reproduce, uh, be reproduced to have all the nutrients that we need. But it doesn't because we rape the fields of all the nutrients and instead replace it with artificial chemicals, which are never going to do the job that the soil itself could produce if we let it rest for an entire year. All this stuff, and we don't do it, but that's why so many people are dying of heart attacks and are so stressed out. Why? Because there's no rest. Why they always say, I need a vacation. You know why? Because they need a vacation. <laughs> if you feel like, I need a vacation, it's because you need a vacation. You need to take some time to do that. Once again, this is another place that I'm guilty in. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't remember my last vacation. When was my last vacation? Yeah, when was my Because they're not really vacations. They look like it, but I'm preaching and teaching everywhere I go. <sighs> right for a vacation. I need my teeth fixed. I need a vacation. <laughs> I haven't bought a pair of shoes in four years, so I need a pair of shoes. Because my, all my dress shoes are falling apart. They have holes in them. And... <laughs> Do I look worried about it? <laughs> I'm so stressed. <laughs> Uh, no, but I do, we do need a vacation every once in a while, so that'll come up to sometime in the future. I'll wait for the Passover. But they're coming to see Jesus, and, and they, they want to see Lazarus because he's, he's a miracle. What a wonderful story. Let's go to the next one, number 239. The chief priests conspired to kill Lazarus. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to see Jesus and putting their faith in him. In other words, they were hearing the story. Jesus raised him from the dead. They were confirming it with other Jews and with Lazarus himself and deciding, well, then there's, there's nothing left to do but believe that Jesus is what he says he is. So, yep, now we believe in Jesus. And many of them were making that simple conclusion. And Jesus, that's why Jesus saved this miracle toward the end of his ministry, because he knew it was going to cause the turning of many, and that was going to cause great jealousy and anger that would cause the chief priest to make plans to kill Lazarus and kill Jesus, to erase this evidence that was causing people to come to the knowledge of Christ. Continue with our journey with Jesus. Number 240, Jesus ascends toward Jerusalem. We see in Matthew chapter 21, Mark chapter 11, and Luke chapter 19. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples. And Mark, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. So we see this account in all three, Luke as well. He went on ahead and going up to Jerusalem. Jesus and said the things that he said in Luke previously. And he went up. So they're ascending toward Jerusalem from Bethany. They went through Bethany, approaching Jerusalem, and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. So from that direction, he was, if you looked at it on a map, you can see how he's working his way into the main city through that area, through via Bethany on the Mount of Olives, where he had spent a lot of time, of course, teaching and praying, and he, that was kind of his hangout, and uh, you could go there and hang out with Jesus, and he would go there secretly, too, 
He would go to a place that he knew very well, and this is what eventually arranged the arresting of Jesus in the end. It was, it was his favorite place, and Judas knew it, and he knew that he was going there, and I'm sure Jesus knew that Judas knew, and I'm sure Jesus knew that, um, Jesus knew that Judas had told them, and so he planned to be there in fulfillment of the will and purpose of the Father. Not an easy job to do, and it wasn't even easy for Jesus. He didn't want to, if he could have the cup pass. So, number 241, he's sending the two disciples off in Luke chapter 19, as he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there with which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Mark, it says the same thing. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany of the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. Just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And he says the same thing in Matthew. Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. You already saw the difference, the very, go back to that scripture for me for a second. Um, you see the difference, it'll say colt, colt, donkey, with her colt, tied to her. The donkey is not the thing that they're gathering, they're going to get the colt, untie them both and bring them to me, but the other one is the only state that they're bringing back the one animal. But if it was the cult of the adult animal, then you see it's not actually a cult of a horse, but it's a small donkey, which is consistent with the plan of kings when they would enter a city in terms of peace. They would not, as a sign, uh, they would ride on a donkey, the colt, instead of riding on a stallion. If they were on a stallion, it meant that they were coming in war. So the gatekeepers would be in the tower watching processions of kings. Kings wouldn't travel alone. Kings would come with a great entourage. I like that word entourage. They'd come with a great entourage. And as they would make their approach, they would look out from the tower and they could tell an indication of the terms in which they were coming would be what animal was being used to convey the king. The king was on the back of a colt. Everything's okay. He's coming in peace. And that way they knew beforehand that it was all right. If he came on the back of a stallion, they knew it's war. Now you get the inference, when Jesus came the first time, in this covenant, the establishment of the earthly covenant between God and man for the opening of the veil and for eternity and time through grace, the covenant of grace come with great peace and love, good tidings, glad tidings of peace. It mentions all that he came to bring and he had to prove that as the king of kings he came on the back of the small animal so that all could know what that meant. He's only bringing peace. However, we see in his return that he is not coming on a, on a colt. He's coming on a stallion. Yeah. His return, he's coming on a stallion because he's coming to conquer and to destroy. And he's so fierce and so angry when he's on the back of that horse. He, it is not going to be the happy Jesus at that day. But he's coming with great force and power and uh, heaven and earth will be afraid of him and the sky and all things will try to get away from him and will find no escape because he's going to be so intensely angry to bring justice. Whew, good thing we're on his side. <laughs> that is one battle line you better choose before the time comes and you want to be on the right side. Be on the Jesus side. You don't want to be on the side of this world. There is no other way to heaven except Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And you're going to meet two kinds of Jesus. You're either going to know and love and meet with Jesus on the colt, or you're going to have to face Jesus on the stallion. We will never face Jesus on the stallion. We will be behind Jesus on our own stallions. You look at the scriptures. We are a part of the army that's coming. So we are incorporated in his forces behind him because we've met him on a call. If we receive him on the donkey, you'll be with him in his army. If you reject him on the donkey, then you'll have to face him on the staff. And that is one more that you will not win. And so in the meantime, people just have to make their choice. And I love this story because there's so much in here, and I've used it for a long time. I like the, 
go find blue spring. I identify those four verbs out of this passage. He tells them, go find loose spring. Go find the animal. Go first. Number two, find it. Number three, untie it, loose it. Number four, bring it. And really, that's the four stages of missions. Go find loose spring. You go, you find the people, you preach to them, thereby loosing them and setting them free, then you bring them into the kingdom of God. And that is a perfect picture of what he's doing with the disciples. He's telling them, go, find, loose spring. So in analogy, I teach those, those four levels. And if anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. If, if anyone asks you, it says in Mark, why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it, the colt, and will send it back here shortly. He just needs to use it. It's like borrowing somebody's car. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell them the Lord needs it. So there, if anybody asks you anything uh, or says anything to you about this, if they want to know what you're doing or why are you untying it, anything that you do for the Lord, you should do it in the name of the Lord. And people ask a question about why you do what you do. There's nothing wrong with you telling them the Lord has need of it. Be, be frank and open about why you're where you are. I get asked all the time, why are you here in Singapore? I'm here to teach the kingdom of God. I teach and preach the story of Jesus. I'm a Christian, and I teach Christian principles. Every taxi cab driver who ine inevitably will ask me, unless they don't speak English, which occasionally happens. But in most cases, we talk. And, you know, I had a, a conversation with the fellow that picked me up. I, I got a taxi back from the airport as we arrived from Cambodia. And he asked me many questions. And by the time we stopped, he got out of the taxi and walked around to, to look at me. He says, I just wanted to see you standing because and, and, you, you're amazing. And I said, mm, well, I said, it's just Jesus. I, you know, because I was telling him the whole thing. He said, uh, he says, you know, it's just really a pleasure meeting you. So thank you. Why? Because he asked me, well, why are you doing this? Why are you here? Why are you untying this animal? You know, why are you loosing people? People want to know. You get people set free. Not everyone's going to understand why, and they're going to ask questions, and you have an opportunity to glorify the Lord and say, it's because the Master has sent me. And this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, saying to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. And that's what they say also in Mark 11, verse 4. They went and found the colt outside in the street, tied in the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? And they answered, as Jesus had told them to. And the people let them go. And it says those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. This is out of Luke. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. It says in verse 6 of Mark 11, They answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it, and he sat on it. They brought the donkey, and the colt placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus said, there's something very significant about the fact that they took off their cloaks. The cloaks were their identity. And they laid their identity down so that Jesus could be honored. They gave up their identity to honor the king. And this is exactly what we do. We lay down whatever you are, whatever you're wrapped in, whatever your reputation is, whatever it is that you are known for, it should be given to honor the king. Take it off and lay it down. And not only did they have the privilege of being able to put it on the animal so that Jesus could sit on this robed beast of burden, which was beautiful, but you know, it had garment, they made it, they dressed it out, they were trying to make it look like you would of a, of a regal environment of a king coming. And the people were so moved by the whole show that later you see they took their cloaks off and laid them in the road and so that the, the animal could walk on their identities and who they were, laying everything down to honor the king. And they did other things, including cutting the branches up, which we'll see. The scripture continues in the next frame, 242, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road. I can just picture this, you know, because I've never seen in the movie them really accurately portray this. 
because these were cloaks or garments that were like a cape that you would use for many things. You still see these in cultures, but you don't always recognize them because they're using them to carry bundles of wood or babies or things. But in a lot of cultures, you'll see a long, in India, the remnants of it are the woman's dupatta, which is the, usually like salwar kameez, and they still wear a dupatta, or they have a sari, which is a very long, you know, they have a six yard or a nine yard, depending Gujarati or whatever the group is, they'll have a big sari. And I remember watching my wife learn to wrap a sari around herself. And that, all of this was similar to the kind of clothing that they would wear. And they would use it to do things. In Mexico, we have a revolso, which is a, an indigenous cloth. It's real long. Some of them are very beautiful. And they would also, they could take that silk, beautiful cloth and carry literally you know, like 200 pounds of wood in it. They were these women, little bitty women, they wrap all that wood, they put it on their shoulder and carry it. So this was all part of who they were. The cloth represented who they are. And it was for these people, but you can just envision everybody's cloaks taken off and a quilt work, because they were not all the same color, a quilt work pattern of cloaks on the road. Imagine from Jesus' perspective on the animal what it looked like to look down at all those cloaks laid on the road and the people leaning in to get a look and some screaming, some hollering, you know, they're, they're, they're cheering the coming of their king. It, it must have been, it's one of the greatest praise and worship sessions that ever took place on the earth. I would have loved to have been there that day, just to be part of it. Uh, you know, that, that, uh, that song we sing where we sing the chorus, about have mercy on me, you know, son of David, have mercy, Hosanna in the highest, that I wrote from that visualization, I wrote that song because I pictured what would it be like, you know, son of David, have mercy on me, you'd just, you'd get caught up in the frenzy of it. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it, many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And we don't know exactly, I mean, we know that that was a ceremony to honor, but it also may be that they didn't want even the dust to rise. They didn't want, maybe the, it was some mud. Maybe they started covering any possible potholes or ruts in the road. They want to make it as smooth as possible, as easy as possible for him to come. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the coat, put, the, put Jesus on it. As they went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. It says also in John, the next day, the great crowd, to come for the feast, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and went out to meet him. And some people have images of them like waving the palm branches. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted. Okay, so now you get the picture of this as Jesus comes to the beginning of this procession. He has all the cloaks start being laid down before him. And as he's passing crowds, they're folding in behind him and they're following him. It says the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed him shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And Mark, the same account. Those who went ahead and those that followed shouted, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Luke, when he came near the place where the road gets or goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This gives us a different perspective and also helps you view better the way that Jesus is seeing it. It was a descent off of the mountain, so the road was coming off the Mount of Olives down. So he could see, in essence, in the lower part, he could see the crowds there forming. And it was a beautiful day. Shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes. In the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found it. A young donkey is set upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming and seated on donkey's colt. That's the account in John. In Matthew, verse 10, in chapter 21, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. Oh, yeah, that was because it was a pretty big production at this point. You have thousands of people putting their cloaks on the ground, they're cheering, they're yelling, 
you could hear this, the city was not really that big of a city. You know, it was not, at that time, populations of cities were small, just several thousand. So even Jerusalem was not, you know, don't think like he's coming into Singapore, because you certainly wouldn't hear him if he's, you know, getting off a boat in Tanamera or something, and, and you're not going to hear the people cheering. But it's small, there's no electricity, there's no artificial sounds, there's no air conditioning, all windows and doors are open, so you hear everything, and certainly they hear the ruckus and the noise of this coming. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. And this is the continuation of what it said previously, also about the reasoning we saw in Luke. Why were people laying the cloaks? Why? Because they'd seen the miracles that he had done. So you had a whole network of people that had been touched by Jesus previously, and they did not leave their homes when Jesus went and traveled abroad, because Jesus did not publicize his departure from the town because they were trying to kill him. So all I know is they got up and went back to the marketplace where he was teaching. They went back to the temple complex where he used to be, and he wasn't. They went to the Mount of Olives, and they tried every venue where Jesus had been speaking, and he was not there. So they were heartbroken, wondering, when will he come? When will he come? And finally the news came. He's coming back. And they all ran out to the road. They were so excited. Why? Because they'd been healed. Many of those people were previously deaf, were previously blind, had diseases and sickness and couldn't walk and they were, you know so many miracles took place over that period of time and they were all there to praise the Lord to exalt him and you know never again never before that or after that has there been anything like that kind of gathering the only place that we will see such a thing will actually be at his final worship at the, at the marriage supper of the Lamb that gathering will be the only thing closest because we will be all of those who were healed, who were blind and see and deaf and hear and were raised and, and, and cleansed of our leprosy. And we're just going to be so, so much gratitude we're going to express. We can do it here on earth in our worship sessions, but like that day, it's kind of hard to do the same. But we will do it. In the meantime, we'll do the best we can right here in a bomb shelter or in a church or wherever we are. We're going to worship him and exalt him because he's. He's worth it. And he triumphantly enters and brings the sign to the people that he's coming to us in peace. Number 243, Pharisees' reaction to all this. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Like, I can tell them to shut up, but then the rocks are going to start screaming. What are you going to do then? <laughs> So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. And look how the whole world has gone after him. Because at that point, if they're saying the whole world, that means that there was no one in the crowd that, that they didn't, re I mean, they could look and see the crowds that this is the whole, they had events. They were the religious leaders. They had special festivals and meetings and they never got turnouts like this. Certainly not with this level of enthusiasm. And the whole city is showing up, and everyone's excited. And of course, they were jealous about this and told them, You need to tell them to be quiet. They're making too much noise. I have had this told me many times about people celebrating the presence of the Lord. Pastor, rebuke your disciples. They're making too much noise. And, and I, uh, I reply, I said the same thing. Look, if I tell them to be quiet, the stones are going to cry. And somebody's got to praise Jesus. Somebody's got to make some noise about Jesus. And if we don't do it, the rocks are going to cry out. There's no rock that is ever going to take my place. I refuse to let a stone stand in my place. I will scream to the heights of the mountains the name of Jesus. I will yell out, Hosanna, in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I'm going to praise him, and I'm going to induce that other people praise him. I'm going to be the instigator of obnoxiously loud praise everywhere I go. 
I want people to make a ruckus and a fuss and do crazy things like take off their cloaks and lay them on the ground, abandoning their identities and their purposes, everything they've ever been trained to do. I'm, I want people to leave their nets behind. I want people to leave the receipt of custom and walk away from their lifelong preparation as a tax collector and no longer do it. I want rich men to climb trees. I want to do everything I can to get people to be excited because if not, the creation itself is going to do it. And it will not do it in my place. It might replace other people, but it will not do it for me. And in the meantime, people are going to try to stop us. And people are going to come against you when you get excited. There will be the Pharisees' reaction all the time. And then they will find out that they'll say, they'll say about you, you know what, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world is going after him. Anything you do for the Lord, there's going to be opposition. I've been reading Ezra these days, and they're trying to, to rebuild the temple, and the political forces are coming, and people are saying, you can't do that. And they're doing it with legal letters, and, and they put a stop work order on them, and then they get the other letters and get the work reinstituted, and it's just, a, there's always something. Anybody does anything for Jesus, people are going to try to stop it. And the Pharisees are very angry. Look, the whole world is going after him. Yeah. I wish, I wish the whole world would go after Jesus. I really do. That's my prayer. And it is the Father's desire, too, that none perish. For God so loved the world, he gave his own son, Jesus. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to know Jesus. But some are going to listen to the Pharisees. And some are going to listen to the religious people. And they're going to be stopped. But not, by, not if I have anything to do with it. Number 244. Jesus weeps for Jerusalem. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And he was weeping as he said this, heartbroken. You know, when, when he said these words, you have to picture there were tears running down his face. The city of David. Remember, David won this city. David took this city from the enemy. And they fixed it and sanctified it and changed it and sacrificed over it and made it a place as a dwelling place for God. And it became Jerusalem to this day. It's focused on by the whole world. Everything is going to end up around Jerusalem. It is the focal point. If you want to know about the state of the world, keep looking at Jerusalem. Yeah. And it will be the indicator. It's the barometer of what's coming and what's happening. It will always be there. I'm not saying you need to go there. Just look at it. I'm not saying you, you, you need to worship anything that is messianic or that is Jerusalem itself. It, but it is Jesus loved the city. It was his place. He knew it. He knew the kind of worship that came from someone who had a, a, a heart set apart for God, who was David. And that city was dedicated it for, for worship and honoring the Lord. And he knew how, how it had been corrupted. And m maybe he had some hope that his coming, maybe he just had hope as these people were laying out all those cloaks and doing everything they could to welcome him. Maybe he had some <coughs> hopes that, hey, maybe something great can happen. Maybe they'll all... Repent. But of course the Pharisees were not going to allow that to happen. And Jesus realized that when they came to stop the procession, and I'm sure they disrupted it, and he told the he was told, you mean tell them to shut up, quiet them down. And he said, I can't, even the rocks will cry out. And then after that he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, and then he started crying. Just weeping, thinking. Because he knew, because at that moment, why he was crying is because he knew that they officially, the leaders of the city, the Pharisees, came to reject him and make it official. We command you to shut up. You're not welcome. 
And then he started to weep because the father, obviously, at that moment, prophetically revealed to him what's going to happen to the city. Son, because they've rejected you, let me show you what's going to happen to the city. And in a vision, Jesus could see the siege ramps being built against the walls. He saw it in the spirit. He saw the enemies climbing over the wall. He saw them dashing the Israelites to death. He saw the murdering of the babies and the sl horrible slaughters that took place in Jerusalem. Horrible things. He saw the absolute destruction. He saw it br brought down to nothing. After he had been torn and rebuilt and torn and rebuilt various times and what we're seeing, what you saw play out in the Old Testament before Jesus' day, and finally the city was back up and then, but it's still not enough. The city was restored. If you study the Maccabees, you go to the 800 years of silence between the Old and New Testament. There is historically value to reading some of the apocryphal books. They're not scripture, but they do give you history of what happened up until the day of Jesus. And then you can go read the writings of uh, Josephus, and there's a lot of information there also. We don't study the scripture because it's not, but there, there's interesting information. And the city was restored why? Because the Messiah was coming. Everything was set. It's like God even had the idea that maybe if they received my son, it'll work out. But we knew that God knew that it was not really going to happen that way because look at the parables that Jesus said. First, you sent the servants, and then another servant. You mistreated them and rejected them. And then another servant. Finally, the landowner said, I'll send my own son. They'll respect him. The owner of the vineyard sent his son. And they said, look, there's the heir. If we kill him, we get it. So the father knew that's what happened. But Jesus, I think, was hoping, maybe, and yet his heart was broken because he saw. He saw what was going to happen to the great city. And number 245, Jesus enters Jerusalem and then goes to Bethany. So Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Basically, he had to fulfill in the right day and time the Father's plan of his entrance. So it was a staged procession by heavenly purposes to show everyone that now my time has come. And they did so. They honored him with all of the pageantry. And now it's done, so he's not going to sleep in the city. He goes back out to Bethany where, of course, he's welcome in the home of Lazarus. And the others in the 12 go back. They all go back basically to set up camp because Bethany was not far away, as you know. Number 246 in Mark 11, verse 12. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seen in the distance, fig tree in leaf, he went find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say, so he's cursing a fig tree. This is kind of interesting. <laughs> Obviously, you know, was he in a bad mood? <laughs> it says that the tree was not in season to bear fruit, so it was not likely he was going to find fruit on it. Was Jesus just looking to pick a fight with the tree? Because, you know, just the, the last thing you know, he, he went to bed sad. He was crying. He went back there, and, and he had a broken heart over the fact that there's no way around this, which he wanted, if possible, let this cup pass for me. So he did have a desire to not have to do all this. It doesn't. So I picture, you know, when you wake up on a Monday morning and you have to go to work, and nothing's really, it's not a happy moment. Happier is like the Friday when you know the weekend is coming, and depending on your schedule. I think this was like a Monday morning for Jesus. And so he cursed a fig tree. The second temple cleansing. Now he goes back, he entered the temple area, and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called the house of prayer. But you're making it a den of robbers. You know, he'd done this once before, you remember. He went in and did the same thing, but now he's coming back because it didn't take them long to put everything back in place, and no matter what Jesus told them. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. 
and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. Same thing in Luke. He entered the temple there, began driving out those who were selling. And the same scripture is mentioned. My house will be a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. This is a, this is the second time that he's doing this. And you wonder why the people didn't stop him. You know, that it'd be like me walking into a church's uh, and going into their little Christian bookstore and start throwing candles around and wiping all the CDs off the shelf and throwing them on the ground. And Why would you do that? Well, because Jesus didn't like it. But they were doing things, that, they were doing it to make a profit. But they were selling religious things. What's the difference? Yeah, I'm not saying, don't worry, I'm not saying that you can't have a religious bookstore in your, in your place. But I find that there's also a lot of corruption that goes around those little religions. Every time I've seen it, there's been some dark cloud over it. And every ministry that's ever had it, something happens. Scandals occur. Problem. Why? Because it's bringing a business into. I don't. I say if you're going to have a Christian bookstore, have it in a mall somewhere. Make it a business. I don't have a problem with that. I go to trumpet parties if I want to buy something on one of those groups. You know, it doesn't have to be in the church. If you have something in the church, make it be giveaway stuff, yeah. free stuff. Yeah. You know, like a Bible rack and a track rack or whatever you want. And of course, you can't really do that so much here in Singapore because of the ramifications of gospel literature printed and distributed, but you can have Bibles. Have a free Bible rack. Take one. They're free. And things like that. But the selling part, a lot is done in the, in the business industry using religious articles. Because you know, it won't take long and they'll have little splinters from the old rugged claw cross and bottles of water from the Jordan. You can sprinkle it on yourself. And be <laughs> Number 248. Matthew chapter 21, 14, Jesus heals many in the temple. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. So here in the 14th verse of Matthew chapter 21, he is setting back up in the temple, which means the whole time he's continuing to do his job, preaching the kingdom of God. Days are running out, and he's got, what, five days, four and a half days left, moving toward the Passover. Jewish leaders seek to destroy Jesus again. Now they, they're trying to find him. When the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? So they were angry because they were honoring Jesus. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Every day he was teaching at the temple. But these teachers of the law and the religious leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words hung on his word. Because they were always around him listening, believing the words, they, there was a barrier. They never could take him. That's why Jesus later says, you know, why didn't you take me when I was in the temple teaching in broad daylight? You have to come here with clubs and swords and torches in the middle of the night, do it in secret, which of course they did because they were afraid of the revolt. It was very intimidating to see a couple thousand people screaming at the top of their lungs on the roadside, laying down their cloak. All the things they've been witnessing. Then the miraculous pop. I don't know how they could have mustered up the, sh the, the gall to oppose Jesus at all after all the things that they saw taking place. But I guess jealousy has no limits to its power, its corruption. Number 250, Jesus then leaves Jerusalem. He left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. When evening came, they went out of the city. So you see what he's doing. As I said, Bethany became his camp, where he goes, settles back, refreshes, has a meal with his disciples, 
takes a breath, and then the next day they would go back in. They were going in and out from Bethany into Jerusalem. He couldn't afford to sleep in Jerusalem. Why? Because of what I was just talking about. They would have killed him too early because they had people in Jerusalem ready, so he had to go and hide. In fact, the thing about Bethany was that a great deal, many, many, the Bible says many of the Jews believed in him there. So there was a big contingency of believers in Christ in Bethany. So it was like a safe haven. He could go back there and relax, and then when the time was right, he could then go in uh, to the city, but not during the nighttime. Only during the day would he go in because of this. And I'm just trying to paint the picture for you of the whole, the way it worked out, how he had to operate in these, in these last days of his life on earth to be able to fulfill the mission. Let's go look at the fig tree that he cursed. <laughs> Early in the morning, as he was on his way back to the city, he was hungry, seeing a fig tree by the road. He went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. Now in Mark, it says, In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. So then some people will say, well, which is which? It happened about the same time. Did he curse the fig tree and immediately the tree withered, as it says in Matthew, or did he curse the fig tree and it took about a day or so for the withering to take place and they didn't see it to the next day? Well, I, I think it could be either one. Either one of these is possible. Or it could simply be that there were two different fig trees. Who said Jesus cursed one fig tree? A lot of people believe that Jesus uh, only, only cleaned out the temple one time. We clearly see that it happened more than one time. And Jesus may have cursed about 25 fig trees for all of them. Maybe he just didn't like fig trees. <laughs> and so he'd just go around cursing fig trees. Maybe he got a reputation. If you knew Jesus was coming, you covered your fig tree. <laughs> Jesus is coming. Hurry up. Cover the fig tree. Put the donkey in front of the tree. <laughs> Jesus, because Jesus spotted behind the donkey. <laughs> tree with him. <laughs> Maybe he ate too many figs when he was a kid and got sick. <laughs> I did that one time as a kid. I ate these little candies called milk duds. The little caramel things with chocolate on them. They're tasty, but not when you eat like 10 boxes of them. <laughs> You get rid of them later if you do that. And I did, and I never could eat milk duds again until I was like 30 years old. So maybe Jesus had a fig issue. Of course, we get the symbolism to this, that if you're not bearing fruit, God has no use for you. Because we don't just see it in this demonstration of a fig tree being cursed. We see it in many parables. That if we bear fruit, we have value to the Lord. If we don't bear fruit, he, he's going to take us down. The parable said that he says, cut that tree down. But yet there is mercy for those who have not done something. And he'll, the gardener will say, leave it, let me fertilize it, give it a little bit more time. That's me as pastor, that's, that's, that's us as leaders, what we do, we believe in people. But often people come to us and they are useless doing nothing but self-serving, self-exalting, bearing no fruit, not doing anything to help anybody else, absolutely not living the gospel. And we know if they continue that way, they will be amongst the goats, and they will have to hear the Lord say, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. We teach all these teachings that make people feel uncomfortable because we don't want those people to be in that position. We want them to have figs hanging on their trees. We want them to bear fruit and a lot of it. It doesn't take a lot of fruit. It just takes some fruit. The problem is not people bearing a lot of fruit, and if you don't have a lot of fruit, then God's not. No, it's just some fruit. The problem is no fruit. The problem is no effort at all. Not even trying. We've got to try to bear fruit in the kingdom. And I'm going to simplify what that means, to bear fruit. How do you... Tell me if a fig tree bears fruit. What proof do you have that the fig tree has borne fruit? Anybody can say it. It has figs on it. You can get a fig from it, which Jesus could not. He was hungry and couldn't find a fig. So then how can you tell if a believer has borne fruit? 
it has believers around it. There are believers hanging off of the believer tree. They're called disciples. People who have believed because of the influence of that believer. Other believers. And that's why I tell you to be very studious about all the passages that talk about our productivity in the kingdom. We produce and we prove to the Lord that we believe what we believe because we bear fruit. It's been my ministry definition of who was saved in Mexico. That's how I define who the Christians were because many people came to the church. Not everybody that comes to church is a believer. And I've seen people attend services in anointed churches for years without knowing Christ. It happens. And the only thing that I can use as the distinction between the real believers and those who I don't know about is this simple principle. Are there figs on the tree? And if there's no figs, then you need to be very careful because that person is not. Maybe you are here and maybe you know people or maybe you are. Like, you know, I don't think I've really... I don't know. Well, then you better know and you better get busy about producing things. It's not hard to do. That You will never be able to use the excuse that you were afraid and that's why you wrapped the mina in a cloth and buried it in the, and you saw what happens with that. We need to do something to somebody. We need to help somebody. We need to love somebody. We need to do the things the scripture says. If they're sick, we need to care for them in their sickness. If if they are, you know, I'm thinking about, we went on the trip and we all went to do things and have fun and Miss Valerie was told about a girl who was blind in one eye and there was a possibility that they could find a way to fix it. They thought it may have, may have been just simply a surgery, a cataract surgery could be done. And Miss Valerie saw that as this, there's no limit. And she called her husband and they were going to do anything possible. So they went to a series that day while Yamel and the others were. Also, when I was hungry, you fed me. That was Yamel and the others cooking in a very hot kitchen all day long because there was no electricity. And, and usually there's at least it's a fan blowing on you. Know, so they're standing in front of boiling cooking stuff with no fan. And it is hot right now in Cambodia. So they were, they were miserable and tired, but with smiles on their faces. And I was proud of them because they were bearing fruit. That's the gospel. It's just that simple. You, when I was hungry, little orphans were eating that night, spread out all over the floor. Like you, That's how simple the scripture is to fulfill. Not just hungry orphans. You're feeding orphans. Oh, can it be so cliche? Yes, it's exactly what well, it's that simple. And I was hungry, you fed me. And so they're doing that, and Valerie's going from clinic to clinic trying to get this child, and finally they determined that it was inoperable, which was kind of sad, but at least they found out what could and could not be done. If anything could have been done, she was going to make sure that it was done. See, that's the kind of people we have in our ministry. People that we're not just going to say, oh, that's a shame. No, we're going to do something. We've got to do something to try to make something different. To bear fruit. Because we know these scriptures are true. And we believe it. Sow your life into other people's lives. Serve other people. Amen? Amen. Don't be a fig tree without figs on it. Well, why? Because Jesus is going to curse me? Well, I won't say Jesus is going to curse you. But it depends on how much use Jesus is going to have for you. When it's all said and done. And that's serious. Well, brother, you know, it's by grace that, yeah, but, you know, read your whole Bible. Read all the scriptures, not just the five or six crocheted scriptures that you put on fridge magnets and, and read the whole Bible. Read the uncomfortable scriptures, I call it, so that we can make responses in our emotions and in our heart according to them. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are showing us the truth. And every day that we learn more, the truth sets us free. Lead us. Guide us. We are so excited about Jesus' ministry, what he did for us, all that he went through. God, I can see the road. I can see the people. I can sense the excitement. And I'm there in that road. And I'm laying down my identity for you, Jesus. Walk on who I am. 
Let it be low so that you can be high. Let me be the base thing so that you can be exalted and raised up above all. I lift you up, Lord. Increase and I'll keep decreasing. Make me less so that you can become more. So that I can be a fig-laden tree with the branches bowing to the ground. So much fruit that my branches are heavy. Lord, I want to bear a harvest. I want a big harvest of souls. I know that it costs. I know that it's difficult. I know that I'm going to have to give up my life to do it, but I have said and say again that I am more than willing to lay down everything, Lord, to bear fruit in your kingdom. Use us, Lord. We pray to the Lord of the harvest that you send us forth into the harvest field to do everything we need to do. We're grateful, Lord, that you even see us as capable of obeying that word. So we're grateful, Lord. Bless this time. Seal the scriptures to our heart, we pray in Jesus' name.